<laughs> Why, what was the problem with Jamaica coming one, two, three in the women? Oh, God. Because all I'm going to hear is Curtis's mouth boasting. That's why they want to come on this call today. Ugh. Jamaicans, I had it from you lot at school. I'm done with you Jamaicans. Oh, man. <laughs> the thing about it, you know, when it's not like England and the World Cup. When you keep winning, it becomes the norm. So there's no braggadocious business going on. It's just uh, like... Was there no, I saw there it Italy been, won the 100 metres. There must have been no Nigerians there. I don't know what happened. He was, I think he is Nigerian originally. There, there was a Nigerian. <laughs> Blessing. Blessing, I can't yes, pronounce her surname. The one where her wig came off. You know, did you see the one where she ran out? She was disqualified for cheating. She took growth um, enhancing drugs. No. Which Kurt, Curtis knows about in a different way. She's not Nigerian, obviously. It was a mistake. It was a mistake. He just gave her a Nigerian name. Eddie, you want to try some growth hormone changing drugs, man? Get some. <laughs> you want to try it, but put it in your cereal. <laughs> I think it's too late for Eddie. He stopped growing it's when too he was late. born. <laughs> so, come on then, Gina. Hey, so you like, don't make this about me. Right. Right. I don't. It's not. The guy put on. himself taller than everybody else on the I screen. Know. That's Wait, amazing. Do, do you use a different high definition screen or something to make yourself look bigger? What happened, Eddie? Wait. He's got a little, he's got Eddie, a little cushion. Eddie, he's got a cushion Eddie, on each chair. Like he walks with it to the barbers. Eddie's like yeah. this. Yeah. 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 What's that, well, Eddie? I I think you're true. <laughs> you carry me foolish. Gina, yeah. I think you're truly American because I know when you left here, you were darker than that. <laughs> Oh, yeah. What are you talking about? Listen, this is not a movie star face. I don't have to do any of that stuff. <laughs> I'm making my money behind the scenes now. <laughs> or wow. playing older. I'm playing old people behind the scenes. That's how I'm making my money. This ain't no movie star look. I don't need to fix my teeth or lighten my skin or do any of that. You look fantastic, Gina. <laughs> fantastic. LA suits you. Or Thanks, America. Lucas. It's not LA that suits me, it's money that suits me. <laughs> yeah? I thought you'd done this a thousand times. There you go. Well, I, I've never done this kind of bootleg recording before, so I'm not quite sure if it's... Do, if do it's you know what the name of the show is, Gina? Yeah, yeah whatever. Eddie Nestor, no joke, and there's no jokes about it. No jokes about it. No, no, no jokes about it. Eddie Nestor, no joke, and there's no jokes about it. No jokes. Do you strongly advocate for black professionals in your industry so comedy comedians or spokespeople do you strongly advocate for them to do work outside of the uk given your success after leave uh, i strongly advocate for people to UK do, do so in whatever they feel will uh give them peace of mind the success that they believe they deserve they need to follow their instincts that's that's what i advocate um some you know, some some black people are doing very well in England right now, right? You have got Mo Milligans and the Judy Loves doing really well in England. They're doing well, and so I wouldn't say to Mo Mo leave England and come to America because he's killing it here. He's he's one of the chosen few, and the, and it is a chosen very few when it comes to black people. But um, if you feel like you're you're being stifled, yeah, the world is a massive place. Go elsewhere. You know. And the thing is, we don't need to, to wait on the gatekeepers to validate us anymore. Mm. You've got a world of internet and streaming. You can make your own, um, you can make your own material. You can make your own shows. That is how people like Mo and Judy got on from making their own content online and building their own fan base. So you don't need to wait for the gatekeepers anymore. So make your own stuff. And, uh, and if you have to, yes, go elsewhere and seek your fortune. I made my own stuff. All the, the two out of those three stand-up specials that you see on Netflix, I shot them myself. Um, I, I hired a theatre, I hired a crew, I had my own director. I made those specials myself and then was selling them out the boot of my car like a rapper selling mixtapes. And then I ended up selling them to the networks and stuff in America. But I was like, I'm not waiting for you lot to give me special. You don't, you lot don't want to give me a special? I'm going to make my own damn special. I don't need your help. So it's all about doing for self. Love it. Thank you very much. Now, why is Donna? What, Eddie? Well, look, I just wonder if you think that that's what more people should be doing then, and not just in drama, in life, kind of, 
you know, we've had guests on before and a suggestion seemed to be that we were waiting for somebody else to do it for us, whether it be assistance or grant. Do you think there's something in there? Definitely. I mean, black people, we always have to work 10 times as hard to get half the, the benefits. So we're living in a time where technology means that we can do our own thing. We don't have to wait for people. So yeah, I suggest, I always suggest making your own thing. Whatever career you're in, do your own thing. Make your own way. Blaze your own path. If they stick an obstacle in front of you, you circumvent it. You jump over it. You dig under it. You just make it any way you can. And don't wait for people. Like, if, I was, if I'd waited for people, I'd still be in England being the token on Mock the Week once in a while. Do you think that 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 people like Curtis should have left as well. Absolutely, absolutely. I told Curtis years ago, come with me. You need to come Curtis, your talent is wasted in England. Thank you, Gina. I just don't have that kind of drive, man. I remember first meeting Gina, I had that drive, it just- Yeah, you hated so me, apparent. Curtis. It's in the book, Curtis. I you How with much a you passion, me? with a passion, you know? But I've always been very honest about that journey, you know, as I am. Our, our relationship was built on hatred. And that's, if you see how I hated Eddie, for years I still do, you know? It's just the way it is. But even when Gina was saying, come America, remember when we went to New York with John yes. Civic, and that energy running from, through, anyway, I don't do a lot of running, as you know, but running through Times Square, the Gina had the hookup for um, the Laugh Factory or one of their venues, and, and grab a little two minute, three minutes on stage, boy. Felt young again, Eddie, it was exciting stuff. But to constantly have that drive, that's never been me. I mean, in my career, remember, I took a hit that I didn't realise how hard that hit hurt me, you know, with me and Ishmael, and I took a hit. And it shook me, it rocked me, rocked my uh, confidence a bit, you know. But we've all yeah. taken hits, Curtis. Yeah, you know, I know, I know. I took? I know, baby. But I talk but about you know, That's what I'm saying. Your whole thing, your whole way of living your life is, is inspirational. Always has been inspirational, man. But you have to have that in you. You have to have that hunger, that mm. drive. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You have to have that. No matter what talent you have, if you aren't willing to sell yourself and push yourself, it's pointless, you know? Yeah, yeah. But one thing I always credit you with, boy, determination. <laughs> and the more they said no, the more you were determined to, to do it. And that, yeah. that is something that everybody should instill in their young people, man. It's so... It's ugly to see, I ain't gonna lie, that American drive. That's why I always knew you was gonna blow up in America, because your energy suits America. It get does. your money up, man. You gotta get your money up, man. It's not I'm that, see. it's not that. It's the Brits, when they make it, they try and pretend to be too humble. Oh, I don't right. know what happened. I, I, it just just fell on me out of the blue. Yeah, I agree with None you. None of them are admit, willing to admit, no, I wanted this shit, I worked for this shit, and I've got this shit. They're always because the condition, yeah, but condition not to celebrate. Yeah, you're conditioned to pretend that you're, you're conditioned to look at ambition as something dirty, That's as right. something that, like outward ambition is seen as oh, gross. She's too yeah. desperate. She's too. And I'm like, no. What's wrong with wanting to succeed and being open about wanting to succeed? Nothing wrong with that. And that, yeah, my energy does suit America in that way because I was always openly like, I want to be the best. I want to be good at what I do, and if I'm good at what I do, then I want the, re the 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 rewards that come with being the best at what I do, and that's how I've always thought. But that might be a Nigerian thing too, because my mum beat that into us as kids: always be the best, be the best. She didn't realise it was going to be comedy and not medical, but you know whatever. And then the frustration in England is seeing people who are far from the best or anywhere near it blowing up beyond, and you're like, really? <laughs> it was unbearable for me. Yeah. And I didn't want to stay and become bitter and angry like some people you see on the circuit. Because when I came out on the circuit, a lot of comedians were horrible to me. They were bitchy, they were horrible, they were backstabby, they they spread rumors about me, they were just awful. And it, but about a year in, I had an epiphany. I was like, oh. These guys are intimidated by me. Mm. Oh, let me give them something to be intimidated by. And after I had that epiphany, I stopped crying in my house about how everybody hated me. And I was like, oh, I'm going to give them something to hate. And, uh, and that's what set me on a path, the path that I'm on now. But yeah, um, 
it's all about just is you know yeah you have to have a certain amount of self confidence you have to have a huge amount of self confidence and drive to be able to get up leave a reasonably successful career in one country and start again from scratch in another but i'm a person i'm like do or die i do it if i fail at least i tried it but i, I never want to spend my life wondering what if what if i'd gone what if I'd done it? Where would I be right now? And I'd hate if someone else who was less talented me than me had gone and done and then blown up. And I was like, I could have done that. So yeah. I've always gone, you know what? I'm just going to do it and see what happens. And if I fail, I fail. If I succeed, I succeed. And then people laughed at me when I left. They laughed, especially the white comics. They laughed their asses. And they used to talk about me behind my back. Oh, where's she going? All she talks about is being African. African jokes, what did she uh, all of that stuff. <laughs> And now <laughs> my African jokes have made me rich. <laughs> How rich, Gina? I think that's what Donna wanted to ask next. In the ballpark, where are we? Where are we now? What's what that? do you mean, where are we? Is where is she? It's not we. She where made she the money, there? we didn't. Well, we're, we're friends. We're friends, Donna. So when I say we, no, no, you see, this is kind of like, you're hoping, like, no, is, you're hoping is, some coconut Jamaicans might like fall you. off of the tree. It's Jamaicans like you that give us a bad name because you're gonna, you're about to beg the thing from Gina, and I can't believe you. You're about to ask her to do something in the barrel. You're asking her to do something in the barrel. I, I can't believe this. What the hell? Go on, Gene. Talk to me, man. Talk, buddy. I know you're not. Go on. Talk about to me, where are you now financially? How are things now? I'm doing What's extremely, the... I'm doing extremely well. I'm getting a piece of the white boy pie in that right. I'm earning money that white guys have been earning for a long time. Like, I didn't realize, you know, I'm a comedian. I've always wanted to do live comedy. I didn't really care. I wanted to be successful, but I wanted to just be a comedian and maybe do a bit of TV and use the TV to sell tickets for my live show. But then I got, this sitcom and I'm I'm writing, I'm exec producing, and I'm seeing the power of being able to create stories rather than just being in front of the camera, being told what to say. Um, I've got uh, the power of creating stories, the power of bringing in other black people. That is my joy right here, that I'm earning this money, I'm creating a sitcom that I love doing, it's based on my culture, I'm able to go, no, we wouldn't say that. That is not authentic. That cannot be in the show. Like having the power to be able to do that and then bring in other people. I'm bringing in actors that would never have get, I've got um, yeah. the opportunities to play themselves on, on TV. And then I'm black writers. I'm, br I'm bringing in black writers. We just hired a new guy uh, who, was wor who works in a factory in Indiana making gas tanks. But, wow. I, but we saw a script of his and I was like, this guy's funny. We need to hire him and give him a chance. And uh, what, what, what about people from England? Is what Curtis wants. Oh, listen, I called Curtis for, for, to all these. Give me all stuff. I called Steve K. Amos. I called oh, Curtis, I all of these guys auditions for the show. Listen, I never, I never forget where I came from. I, I turned around and I was like, Curtis, I got the show coming. Get your Nigerian accent on point because <laughs> I want you to audition for this show. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the audition, Eddie. I saw African actors, right, who I didn't know were African until I saw them in full regalia wearing their African tribes clothes at the audition. I phoned Jean. I said, "What? Were we supposed to dress in a certain costume?" She goes, "No." I saw people walking around fanning themselves with the tails of sheep. Bah, bah. Oh, oh, Curtis, yeah. What, what, what you do? You, you, and then went what in. Happened, but, yes, hello, my friend. Yes, and then I did it. I've never been able to do it. I said to her, put in a West Indian guy or or or, or, or something. Oh, I, he's African. And well, then Gina phoned me and cast me back. You know, with the power that the idea of Gina sitting down, watching me, or laughing on a video, laughing I for all the wrong reasons. La Laughing for that is, I said, that's the power. You but never you told me that, that Chris. Position, you never you said that. You never I, told me that you auditioned for it. Listen, I called Eddie. Curtis first. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> I called Curtis first. I said, Curtis, I've got a pilot. I've got this show coming. This show might be big. Let me <sighs> God, I love I'm you, Gina. Uh, Gina, you made my whole day. I'm going to live off this story. Listen, for years. Audition, 
I still keep that audition when I'm feeling sad. The audition tape. <laughs> Anytime you have to you do draw for it. I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, Eddie, she just sat down with me and she's telling me the story about this guy. Um, Chuck, she didn't even know who the hell he was at first. Chuck Lorre, who does Big Bang Theory. And she's debating whether to have the conversation with these people. He want to fly her to LA. Hey, I turned it down. Yeah. I remember we were sitting inside a bar in Brixton and you're telling oh, no, you'd spoken to people prior. And you're there thinking, and I'm like, do you know who that is? That guy's done Big Bang Theory. He's done about 17,000 shows that all hit. But like Big G, the Asher is going, I don't know. I don't but know. Kate, I'm not you to know it. how it's been for us where you've seen yeah, our ideas stolen, you've seen us used, and that look. And so I had that mindset because I was like, they wanted to meet me. I met them, and, and they, at first they were talking about me being a consultant on all things yeah. African. And I was like, I don't want to be a consultant on those shows. So you can steal my ideas, steal the essence of what I do, and then I get no credit. And I've, yeah. it's happened to me so many times over the years where I've uh, done stuff on, like, I remember when I had that show on BBC Choice back in the day, and they were like, I had a talk chat show, and they were like, remember they tested all these different comedians? Doing That's right. When BBC Choice first started, and they went, which, yeah, which, what was the name of the guy they went with? Little. Yeah, Ralph Little. So Ralph Little. Yeah. So they were like, everybody's gonna have a chat show every day for two weeks, and whoever's show gets the best viewing figures and, and it is 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 will win. It's like a competition, and you will get a show when BBC Choice becomes BBC Three. And my show was by far the best curse. Now again, I called you, I called yeah. Eddie. Eddie, yeah. you came, I got you in as a writer. Because that's what I do. I always bring in my people. And we wrote a good show. And it was a good show. And we had the, our audience was queuing up round the block. And I had a friend who worked within the BBC at the time. And they said that my viewing figures were higher than all the other people. But then when it came to giving the show to the winner, they went with Ralph Little because he was off the royal family and, the, and he was a white, young white dude and they thought he'd fit the demographic better. He had no comedy chops. He had no uh, skills at talking to people whatsoever. And the show lasted one series and then got dumped. So that was one of the first things in, in, that broke my heart in this industry. And I pioneered ideas on that show that I saw used in other shows later. Yeah, like, yeah. When I used to do my mum character who used to come and harass the guests in the in the dressing room before the show and then I, they'd come out for my, their interview with me and i'd go oh i hear my mum was harassing you in the show and then we cut to a vt of that that stuff that we were doing years later i went in for a meeting with the bbc and i was like listen that idea that i pioneered i i, I still want to do this chat show i still think we can use this idea of the characters harassing the guests beforehand and you know what this person said to me oh yeah we're we're doing that now with stephen k amos so basically, they didn't want to do my show, but they took the elements of the show that I pioneered and did it with other people. So these are the kind of heartbreaking things that happened to me, the knocks that I got that made me just go, you know what, i got to get the fuck out of here. Otherwise, I'm going to end up bitter and angry, and I just need to, I need to go and see the world. I need to go and see if I can swim with the big boys. And then what was the other one? Uh, Jocelyn G. When Jocelyn got her show, listen, I got no... Hatred towards Jocelyn, I got no ill feeling towards her. But when she got her show, I was like, well, <laughs> that's it for me. Because yeah. it, it felt like being passed over for promotion. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's like, I've been there, they've been dangling the carrot. If you come and do this, then we'll give you a show. If you come and do this for us, come, we'll give you a show. If you, and I kept doing all the things, jumping for all the hoops. And then when it came, they were like, let's go with a younger, prettier, more palatable version of you. And hence the Jocelyn G's and the Andy Osho's. You know what I mean? They were just more palatable, more malleable versions of me. Maybe I was too, too but much. From my side of it, because I know pretty much all of you guys, and the love that and the respect you lot have for each other, the industry makes you have these um, feelings towards, especially with the black women, man. It's, it's so unnecessary, but it's like it, it crabs in a barrel and everybody's fighting back. It's just the way the industry is designed because we know only one is going to get that slot. And that slot will last for about four years, maybe, if, if you're lucky. It's funny that's that you that say kind that. Of pressure. 
exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. That that Mo Mo was saying that about you know Big Shaq and Michael when we did their show. I don't know if that bit made the cut, but they said they used to offer them both the same thing, and they designed it so that they wouldn't like each other, not knowing that they speak to each other and right. have a big respect for each other. So and sorry, I'll be, I'll be, say again with who? Big Shaq. Michael. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mo. And they right. were like, that, and they talked about it. And they said they didn't know that we phoned each other. Oh, I had a phone call for, yeah, I had that same phone call. And they maybe yeah. have moved on past us where yeah. we might hear it and yeah. not talk to each other. But so the I times have changed. So you've got that social media connection where a lot of acts, especially during lockdown, I know a lot of comedians now are communicating with each other and supporting each other more than I've ever seen in my career. I've never seen that. And there's some of it is quite genuine. Like Mo Gilligan, what you get from him is, is that genuine, nice guy. You don't think so? Genuinely definitely. a nice guy. No, no, I've interviewed him, and I think definitely. And one day I'd like to interview his dad as well, Rasta man yeah. who took him and gave him more spiritual things. Look, I, I'm going to do this Because I'm not used to comedians being nice. It kind of unnerves me. I prefer the hostility. <laughs> you, you, I like when you, you go in the green room. You hated me so much, Curtis. You didn't believe me. Yeah, because it, it fueled you. you. Look what it made you do, woman. What's <laughs> up in your pool? You <laughs> said everything to him. Right, stop. Because I have to do, I have to do some social stuff. Because okay. we'll cut it up. And I want to talk about social stuff and the book. And Donna, I need you to ask at least one more question so that when I edit it, you don't look like um, somebody's girlfriend is just hanging in there around the corner, <laughs> hoping that nobody can see you. Hoping is that they finish right? playing their music. Yeah. Talk again, Gina. Why are you not coming for me like that? I'm listening to what the sister's got to say. Why are you exactly, coming? Donna. Don't let them talk they to you like that. Don't let them and like Ed, that wait, and, and offline, Eddie will say, no, no, D. I'm not. Hurry, come up like Curtis. I can wait. <laughs> I know how to, I know how, I know how to <laughs> pace myself. I'm not. I'm not. Do you hear me beg Gina for money? <laughs> oh, really? She's a typical Jamaican. So I'm a Jamaican. <laughs> 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 Right, Gina, I'm gonna... I, I sat with you in a cafe in Leytonstone. I think you were waiting to go in to do your hair, and clearly it was busy. That hairdresser was very busy, and there's a lot of times they never let you in because when I used to look at you, you never, <laughs> clearly never went there. And oh, you, 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 oh. had a, you had a contraption. And I don't know if you remember, Gina, you had to open the bottle with this wire contraption. Yes. And that, that was the lupus. Now, one of the things that we haven't dealt with on, on No Joke, which I'm really embarrassed about, is lupus. It's something that a lot of people suffer from. Just tell us a little bit about your lupus journey. Okay, so I was diagnosed with lupus in 2005. Um, I started to notice that... I couldn't wait when I woke up in the morning, I couldn't open my eyes. That was what started the whole journey. And I, I got worried. I thought, what's wrong with my eyelids? Are my eyelids paralyzed? Is this what's happening? And what happened, the lupus, and I had a combination of lupus and Sjogren syndrome, which is what, is it, is it Serena that had it or Venus Williams? One of the sisters had it. But basically it attacked my tear ducts. So I wasn't producing tears. So when I was waking up in the morning, my eyes were so dry that my eyelids were stuck to my eyeballs and I couldn't open my eyes. So that was what started me on the journey to the doctor. Then I started to feel joint pain. My hands started to hurt, my knees started to hurt. So, I, you know, I started work researching it as you do. And it, I came up with either rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. I was like, one of these two, I did a lot of research. And I was like, well, I hope it's not rheumatoid arthritis because that destroys your joints after a while. They put you on all these drugs. And, so when I went into a rheumatologist, I was diagnosed with lupus and I was like, oh, right, well, I, I think I can work with this. I can work with this. Um, over a period of time, the symptoms got worse to the point where my hands were deformed. You know, when you get that deformation and you're not, like, you can still see there's a little bit of damage to my knuckles and stuff where my skin, where the, my knuckles swelled up, my joints, I, I couldn't walk properly. I had a raised toilet seat in my house. I had all of that. I was pretty much good. You didn't know because when I went out to perform, dosed myself up with drugs and steroids to get on the stage. And then I'd come home and just be 
like that. But so nobody really knew what was going on. But yeah, I had, a, I couldn't open bottles because my hands were so swollen, my arthritis got so bad that I couldn't open bottles and cans and things. I had a contraption to open bottles because I couldn't, my hands were like this. Um, horrible migraines, arthritis, dry eyes, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, they were putting, they, the doctors were like, t you know, all the drugs, steroids, you know, prednisone, all this. And at one point, the doctors were like, you know what, we, it's getting worse and worse. We don't, we don't quite know what to do. We're thinking of maybe giving you chemotherapy, which is what we use for cancer patients, but it will blast your whole immune system and maybe we can start again. And that's when I was like, oh no, this, they, 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 they're experimenting on me like a guinea pig. I've got to find a way out of this. In the meantime, I watched a TV called, show called Celebrity Detox. Uh, it was on years ago and I remember it was Kim Wilde, that pop star from the 80s, Richard Blackwood, one of the hairy ones from Boyzone and someone else were all taken to Thailand where they do a fast for seven days with colonic irrigations and stuff. And at the end of it, now at the time I was like, I'm going to say 15 and a half stone at this point uh, from, the, from the drugs, the steroids they were giving me because they make you blow up. And I ate ate like a pig too. So a combination of the two. And um, so I saw this TV show where Richard Blackwood and all them guys went to Thailand and they do colonics and, 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 and fast for a week, like no food, just liquids for a week. Richard didn't take it seriously. Him and the boys on go guy kept sneaking out and buying burgers on the street and then sneaking back in. But Kim Wilde stuck to it. And I mem never forget that at the end of the week, the, the voiceover said, Kim Wilde, had problems with whatever, some health issues, and they disappeared after the week, and she lost a stone in a week. And I was like, huh? I went online and booked myself into that same resort the same night I watched the show. I was like, on the computer. So I went to this resort, did the same detox, also lost a stone in a week, and that's where I discovered that food is medicine. I, I came back, it took me a few years to get it into my head, but a few years later, I kept going back every year and doing this detox and sorting out my health, and I went raw vegan. So food is medicine. I cut out meat, I cut out dairy, I cut out all processed foods, and I went raw vegan for about six months. And I'll tell you what, within weeks of completely changing the way I eat, all the inflammation in my body went down, like all of it. I was able to throw out that raised toilet seat, my joints got better, I got healthier, I lost a load of weight because I was eating healthier. But the most important thing is, I came off all the medication. The doctors were like, you can't come off that medication. It will kill you, your body will go into shock. <clears throat> and I was like, this medication is not healing me. All it does is manage the symptoms. You're not trying to get to the root of why my body is now reacting against me and, and attacking good tissue. All you're doing is giving me painkillers and stuff to, to mute the, the symptoms, but you're not actually trying to find the root cause. I'm trying to find the root cause and I can't find it while taking your drugs. I came off all the medication and, and, and used food as my medicine. That was in 2009. It's now 2021. I've not been on any medication for lupus since then. And I've managed my health with just my food. Food is medicine, people. Definitely. Yeah, people don't know. Like, we're, we're, we're conditioned to believe doctors all the time. Mm. Oh no, take this medication. Like, you know, they'll give you any, but you don't realize the pharmaceutical industry is a profit-making industry. They're not here to heal you. They're here to manage you manage your symptoms while making money from just feeding you drugs. None of these drugs are there to heal you. All they do is manage. And it's all about getting back to basics and, and trying to discover why your body is reacting. The body's an engine. If, if you've got a car, you don't put oil in it, starts, it starts to go wrong. You've got to go back and go, why? Because you're not putting the right stuff into your car and that's why it's not working properly. And there's environmental stuff, the stuff that they put in the food, all this GMO stuff, the sugar, they put sugar in everything. And sugar is, the, to me, the leading causes of a lot of cancer. So I've had to cut out the sugar. I'm, and I'm a sugar junkie. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do any drugs. Sugar is my drug. 
So I've had to find other ways to get that sweet fix. But sugar is one of those things. Cancer clings onto sugar like a magnet. So yeah, it's all about looking at the food you're eating and seeing what they put in your food and eliminating the stuff that is not good for your body. If you can't pronounce what's in the food, then it ain't meant to be in the food. Food is medicine. Well said. So, Gina, in, if you're in honesty now, like this last year, in, in regards to Black Lives Matter and the year we've had pandemic, what have has changed for you in regards of personally? What's been the most poignant thing that's happened for you during this um, testing time? For me, for, for me personally, I've become a, you know, I've always been outspoken, but I got to a point in the last couple of years where I've, I, I'm at the point where I do not care. I will say what I say. I've always been that person, but I feel like I've taken it to another level where I'm just like, this is what I'm gonna say. I don't care what people think. I'm gonna say what I say and I stand by it. I stand by what I say and I don't care if what people call me. I've had white people call me racist. I've had people call me this, call me that. And I'm like, I'm gonna keep saying what I'm saying. And, and for me, being able to live in my truth and just say what I say and it not affect my work. Because before I used to be a little bit worried about saying certain things because it would it might affect my work. But when I got this show out here, I made it clear to them. I was like, listen, I am who I am on social media and it's not going to change. So I'm going to be saying some controversial things, but it's all based in truth and it's not coming from a place of malice. And I'm going to continue being that person. So if you're going to try and censor what I say online, you can't do that. And, and the joy of being behind the scenes as a creator of the show means that I've got that freedom to be able to say these things and not worry about my work being taken away. And because I've made my living doing my own thing all the time, and uh, I haven't got that fear that I might have had if I was relying on other people to make my living. So that's one of the, so I was able to speak candidly about all the things that are going on um, in a way that a lot of black celebrities have been very quiet like if you look a lot, a lot of black celebrities are quiet i know that they feel the same things that i do behind closed door closed doors but because their work is coming from other people they feel like they haven't got the freedom to speak out publicly so i'm doing that work in that i'm like you know what i'm just gonna say what i'm gonna say because when i was trying to play the game it did nothing for me anyway so i might as well just be who the hell i am anyway because playing the game and trying to be all happy smiley gina you know, jumping through hoops and trying to nip at that carrot did nothing for me. So that, I think in the last couple of years, that is a realization and epiphany that I had. And I'm enjoying it immensely because I do not care. I don't care. I say what I say. And I think I'll speak for a lot of people that said the empowerment you've given to, especially to being here and seeing a lot of the female comedians, some you don't even know yet. But that inspiration you're giving people is, is commendable, mate. Thank you, really, really hearing you, and it's nice, nice to know you. Thank you, Gina. I'd like to hear your thoughts on, as somebody who's like a Black British icon, not like her, you are a Black British icon. Um, your journey, we've all seen it. We were, I think, we're similar age groups. So when you were young and you were doing your thing, we got the jokes. You were funny. I've always admired the way that you owned your Africanness in a time and a generation when actually it was we not cool. Hidden. Right. You were out there like, I don't business. I always like the way that you spoke about your mum and your mum's forthrightness. So you are a black British icon. You've written a book. What are your feelings around more black women using opportunities to write, to put down their feelings, their story, their journey? Because we don't have a lot of it. Um, and, and, you know, I'm going to use a phrase that they use from the grassroots. I hate the phrase, but you get what I mean. Yeah. People have had a, a lived life at the bottom looking at you now making it at the top like you said commanding white man money how do you what do you, do you add, what, what are your feelings around getting more capturing more of those stories and that essence for black women like yourselves coming from where you've come from absolutely i'm all about look the 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 time when only the white stories were being told that is coming to an end some people are embracing it some people are frightened by it and fighting against it but people are more interested in different stories now 
you know, my show that I make in America is called Bob Hart's Abishola. Uh, it's about a white guy who falls in love with a Nigerian nurse. And it's the coming together of those two cultures. Now, that show, I was trying to pitch a show with my Nigerian culture for years and had doors shut in my face. Nobody was interested. They're like, ah, we don't know. We don't know if, you know, Middle England will get it. And then when I tried to pitch the show in America, then executives were like, oh, we don't know if people will get it. Like, it's only when Chuck Lorre, who is the king of sitcoms, he's the man behind Big Bang Theory, Two and a Half Men, Mike and Molly, like Young Sheldon, now uh, Kaminsky Method on Netflix, like the guy's a genius. But it's only when he went, I want to make a show with Nigerians. Then everybody sat up and listened. So even though I'm definitely the power and force behind this show and making sure this show is working and making sure it's good, I'm, in there, I'm sitting there in the casting rooms and make sure that when them black actors come into audition, they see me. So they know they're not going to be asked to do any kind of buffoonery. Um, I make sure that I get black writers in the room, you know, so that, you know, when we're writing this stuff, we can all make sure it's... Pro that's the kind of stuff I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to get to the point in my career where I think I'm moving into another phase of my career where I'm going to be producing other people. So what I want to do now is turn around and get stories from black women. I want to get black women and go, listen. And I've said to Chuck and the guys, I was like, listen, you lot found me, but there's a lot of me's out there. Let me find them for you and then we'll all make money. So that is my dream now is to move into that exec producer role where then I can turn around and get black women's stories and get uh, with books written by black women that might not have seen the light of day and go, this is a really good book. I think we should make something out of it. So that's gonna be my, that's what I wanna do moving forward. I'm moving away from the, you know, I'm still always gonna be a stand up because that's my first love, comedy is my first love, but I'm getting older now and the young people, that's their thing now. So my thing is now to move behind the scenes and try and create content and get and pull other black people to get the black stories out there because there is a hunger for it now. You know, yes. in America, we've got shows like Insecure. You know, this show would not have been made seven, eight years ago. Michaela Cole is killing it with very specific stories about her life that might not, she might not even got a look in eight, nine years ago. If she pitched that show to the BBC years ago, they'd have been like, oh, I'm not sure. I don't think it. <laughs> so, People are hungry for different stories and different points of view and something fresh and different. We're bored of the same old white dudes uh, telling the same stories about masturbating and whatever. We, we want new yeah. stories. So yeah, I'm all for black women creating content, write your books. If you've got a book in you, write that book because one day I'm gonna be coming and looking for those books to make shows out of, trust me. Wicked. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Up. I like that. I like that. I like your answer because it, for me at the community level, I'm always talking, you know, I'm trying to start a, a community level, almost like TEDx, but not the same, but a speaking platform where we get those stories out because I believe that getting the stories out, Gina, is part of the therapy. It's part of the healing. If you don't, oh. you would have seen a Fua Rose. I don't know if you follow a Fua Rose. It's kind of talking about some of those experiences that have been had in the black community in the 70s and 80s. Now, for me, those women having that opportunity and getting that down, pen and paper, or however they choose to get it out, it's part of the healing process, you know? Oh, so I'm, really, yeah, I'm really, really happy to hear your response. Absolutely. I mean, writing this book, a lot of it is based, it's, it's the whole history of my life. It's not just about the comedy aspect of my career. It's being born in East London, in Bethnal Green, and coming up with the skinheads spitting on me when I was eight years old, and the National Front, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the racism that, because in America, they think racism is so genteel. They're only starting to get a piece of it now with what's been happening with Meghan and, and, and Harry and Meghan and all that. But before that, they didn't realize that the, the, the Brits were the architects of racism. Of course. But they, Americans, Americans, all they think is, ooh, you know, tea and crumpets and Hugh Grant and everybody's very sweet and genteel. They don't understand. So I'm, you know, in the book, I completely tear that shit wide open and let people know what we, what I went through as a child in London in the seventies and eighties. That it was not genteel. The racism is just as insidious in England as it is uh, in America. And so. And it was very cathartic writing this book. It was very cathartic because all your, and you don't realize you're holding on to all this anger 
resentment and tension in your chest. As I was writing the book, it all just poured out of me. And it was like, oh, it was a release. So yeah, yeah, more women should definitely do that. Thank you. We love should, that. But the others. When's the last time you cried, Gina? Uh, on Saturday. <laughs> One of my writers, young black woman, Ibet Inyang, young Nigerian woman, got married on Saturday. And I hate weddings. Weddings bore me. And she's Nigerian. Her husband, her now husband is Haitian. It was a beautiful wedding. She looked amazing. And it's wonderful because she's a young writer on our show. And it's great to, to, to be able to give her that opportunity. And after her, our show, she's going to be able to go on and do anything. And uh, when the doors opened and she walked in wearing that dress, looking so beautiful, I cried like a little bitch. <laughs> I hate admitting that because I'm tough. But yeah, that was on Saturday. Cried like, a, cried like she come out of my own vagina. It was embarrassing. Uh, uh, we've got our own ninja here, um, as named by the boss lady, Ninja Benjamin. How much of your success do you owe to Ninja? Because you and I have had this conversation on other platforms. But part of you speaking freely, and even though you don't know music on your name, that tune, do you know Whatever. that tune, foolishness? Right? Whatever. When I saw Gays Go Camping, or whatever you decided to call it. <laughs> that, that foolishness just made me laugh out loud. <laughs> that that freedom, you didn't have that freedom when you were here. When, when me I and Boss think. Lady, when me and Boss Lady came to your house, we didn't even talk about it. You did not have that freedom with yeah. Lena here. Yeah, I mean, when I was coming up as a comedian, I got famous first on the black comedy scene. That was where I got big after blouse and skirt, I was selling tickets to black audiences. And um, I come from an African family, my mom's very Christian. So the whole gay thing was just not something that she was wanting to hear. And also when I was doing comedy, people were like, oh, you can't come out because black audiences are super homophobic. You're gonna lose what you've built so far. So there was that fear. And then also there was the thing of, look, I'm already a black woman in this industry. I've already got two things against me. I didn't want to add something else for them to box me in with. So these were the fears that were swirling around in my head and why I never wanted to come out publicly. The rumors were out there. You know, I beat up a couple of comedians who took, who <laughs> it's, in the, it's in the book, it's in the book, but I did. I beat up a couple of comedians who chat, who, who, were, who outed my business before I was ready for it to be outed. Um, but, you know, I played the game, I did the dances and it got me nowhere. And it got to a point where why am I pretending? I was never pretending, I never lied. Like whenever I did interviews, and I remember doing an interview with The Voice and they asked me straight up. And I never lied, but I, I circumvented the question. So someone would say, oh, what did you say about these people who say you might be gay? I'd say, I'd say things like, well, I don't care what they say about my sexuality. If they say I'm not funny, then I'm coming for you. Yeah, so yeah. that's how I used to circumvent that question. Um, but I got to America and, you know, I was like, am I going to carry on being the same person? I don't really want it. I'm, I'm getting to a point where I was like, I don't care anymore. I played the game. It didn't work for me. I'm just going to be who the hell I want to be. And I've, I've got to a point where I built up a good audience of people who love my comedy. And I'm like, if they're not going to, if they're going to stop coming to my shows because they don't like who I love, then maybe... Maybe they don't, they didn't really like me properly for me in the first place. So, yeah, I just, I didn't want to make a big deal out of coming out. I didn't go, I'm going to come out. I am gay. I just kind of slipped it into my shows in conversation. I was throwing a joke here and there, I was throwing a joke there. And then, you know what? When I did that, I'd always been a great comedian. But when I did that, I became a much better comedian because there was no fear. There was, there was no, oh, somebody might say something that, you know, somebody who might have seen me in a club might say something. That fear went away because I'm like, this is who I am and there's nothing you can say to me because I've got nothing to hide anymore. And I became, my comedy went from here, which is pretty good, to here. It, I just opened up in a way that I'd never, like when I started out doing comedy, I thought it was, I was pretty good because I had to find other things to talk about because I couldn't talk about relationship stuff. So that's why I came from these different angles. I, I played the Nigerian thing, I did other things because I had to 
So it made me stand out at the beginning because I had to talk about other stuff apart from relationships. But then it got to a point where I was stifled. And once I let everything go, I was able to talk about more stuff. I was, and I don't talk about being gay throughout my entire set. That's just one small facet of my personality. But when I do, like I've got a routine about when Nina met my mum, and it's a beautiful routine, when Nina came and bowed before my mum, like she did the Nigerian bow. And my mum looked at her and was like, look at this, this white woman is a better Nigerian than Eugene. <laughs> and it's a beautiful routine. And, and I never told Nina to do that. She just researched. Yeah. I was like, oh, if I'm going to meet Nina, uh, Gina's mom, I want to show her her due respect as an elder Nigerian. And she knelt before my mom. And my mom, who's never probably spoken more than four words to white people in her entire life, loves Nina like her own daughter. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. stuff like that, I would never have been able to talk about 10 years ago. And now it's opened up stories. And I, and I feel like there's a, lot of, there's a lot of black people in the gay community that can't speak. So I'm, I'm going to be like, look, we're here. Take it or leave it. You can pretend it doesn't exist. But it, I was born this way. My mum knew from baby that there was something different about me. You know, I was a tomboy from two years old. I, uh, I used to fight when she tried to put me in dresses. So it's not, people go, oh, it's a white man thing. It's a white man. It's not white man thing. Africans, Africans were not homophobic before white missionaries came to Africa. Africans never classed people by gender. They classed people by their spiritual uh, abilities and their spiritual attributes. It wasn't gender specific. In, in Africa, before white people came, there were people who, males who exhibited more feminine qualities and, and females that exhibited more masculine qualities. And it was not a big deal. It was all about the spiritual. But then when white missionaries came with their Christianity and were like, this is and that's and then black people took on that stuff and and now we are the most homophobic when white people most white people not most a lot have moved on from that type of thinking but africans were not homophobic before white people came we weren't we just weren't there are still tribes that practice certain types of homophobe homopho ho ho homosexual behavior there's a tribe that uh, once a year, the men dress up as women and go out at night and the women have to stay inside. So there's tribes still practicing uh, certain things like that because it's not about gender, it's about spirit. So anyway, I'm a free person now. I don't care anymore. I am who I am. Right. So Buy my book, people. There's a part two in my brain. There's a part two. And uh, I want to write it, but I ain't writing it unless this one sells. So buy the book. Listen, you're, you're going to like it. It's a good book. It's you don't, a good Gina, book. Gina, you don't need to do that. I'll do that because no, no, I'm telling it you, is, it is fabulous. No, Gina, you don't need to do that. Okay, that's what yeah, yeah, that's man. what was Curtis was saying. This is an English audience, right? We don't we don't really like that. He sounds too boasty. Eddie we, Nestor, no jokes, and there's no jokes about it. No jokes about it. No, no, no jokes about it. Eddie Nestor, no joke, and there's no jokes about it. No jokes, no jokes, no jokes, no jokes. Eddie Nestor, no joke, and there's no jokes about it. Best podcast on the air, and it's a shame to live without it. Curtis Walker, funny guy, telling truths, never lie. With boss lady by their side, we don't deliver it. It's the sky, no disparity, just hilarity. With the fallacy, you can give it back to charity. That's the ACLT helping people in need. With founders and trustees wanting you to succeed. Mm. African Caribbean, leukemia trust. African Caribbean, leukemia